Now, before we get into it, I wanted to make a video targeted at myself from early university. Before I knew about controls, but I knew a little bit about signals and differential equations. If these things sound intimidating or unfamiliar to you, there's some amazing videos already out on YouTube to develop your intuitions behind these concepts. And I aim to make some future videos talking about the beauty of the math myself as well. Without further ado, let's get into it. Control system engineers are focused on controlling or altering a particular aspect of the system or an environment. The environment could be something like the temperature in this room, and the control engineer would try to design a controller to try to get the temperature in this room to what they desire. Control theory can tell us something as simple as controlling voltage in a circuit, or something as complicated as navigating a spacecraft between here and Mars. What characterizes a control system is the fact that you have a desired outcome, and an actual outcome. And control theory is all about marrying these two things together. A common control system is cruise control in your car. And you have your desired response, say you want to go 70 miles per hour, and you have your actual response, which is 65 miles per hour right now. Control theory tells us how to get from 65 to 70. Now let's put some of these words into math. Air is the difference between input and output or the desired response and the actual response. A good control system will aim to reduce error to zero, thus shaping the system's response into what we desire. Now probably the most important definition in control systems is the plant or the process, which is the system or the aspect of the system that you want to control. And often this is the thing that we have the mathematical model of that we can then append things around and try to control. The overarching concept is that we have inputs going into the plant, which is going to react in a particular kind of way, and generate outputs that we can measure with the sensor. Now in order to have this formulation that we've outlined above, we need to encode our inputs in a way that the plant can actually react to. And how we do that is by using a controller, which generates actuator inputs that then the plant can actually respond to in a physical manner. And this is what's known as open loop control, because there's no feedback. A more important version of control, and in practice, one that's used a lot more often, is known as closed loop control. The formulation is in general pretty similar, except now we're going to have a sensor that's going to feed back our output, and we're going to generate an error term, namely by subtracting the output from the input, and the controller can now handle that error term. In practice, closed loop control systems are almost always preferred, except it's contingent upon the fact of being able to read your output which in practice for aerospace systems is sometimes very difficult to do and we'll get to more of that in future videos. Now the whole suite of tools generated for classical control can only be leveraged if you have an LTI model of your system. I can't stress enough how important the following definitions are and if you're studying mechanical or electrical engineering you'll be blessed with seeing these definitions a little bit more than one time. LTI stands for linear and time invariant system. The property of linearity says that if you send in a superposition of two inputs, then the output should just be a linear combination of them both. And here, alpha just is scaling your input, u is your input, and f is the linear transformation that your system applies onto your input. The property of time invariance says that the relationship between output and input remains constant in time. Now this can be a little bit confusing because your input can vary in time, your input could be something like a sinusoid, but it's just saying that f, the thing that does the linear transformation, is not depending on time. But how do you get this LTI model? If your system falls into a simple class, then you could just model your system with physics, like a circuit, a DC motor, an AC motor, etc. But the harsh reality is that a lot of systems don't fall in this class. In that case, you're going to need to do some system identification. Now this part is going to vary an extreme amount based on the application that you actually have, but it's worth mentioning that this is why classical control is so intertwined with dynamics and physics, is because most of the time you actually have to identify your system in the first place. How does your system actually react to actuator inputs? How do I obtain an LTI model of a nonlinear system? And how do I create a model that's fully representative without being oversimplifying? And this is the whole point of system identification. Now once you've identified your system and you've built a controller around it, there are some crucial metrics to evaluate your controller. If the dotted line is your desired output, your controller's response could look like this. And it's going to take some amount of time to rise, 
there's going to be some amount of overshoot, there's going to be some amount of settling time, and there's going to be some steady state error. The control designer's goal would be to mitigate all these things and perform the trade such that you can optimize certain things with respect to the others. You might accept a little bit more overshoot if it means that you can settle faster. The control designer can choose how they approach a desired output. It can be really fast like the one on the left, or it could be super slow like the one on the right. And sometimes, just due to the dynamics of the system, you actually don't have a lot of control over this matter. You can append a controller all day, but if the dynamics of your system are inherently slow, then you're going to have to approach your desired output slowly. Classical control and control systems more broadly have a major emphasis on the conversation of stability. Namely, how does the design controller impact the system stability? By adding in a controller and closed loop feedback into your system, you inherently change the system's dynamics. And this can make an unstable system stable, or it could do the opposite. To evaluate the system stability, you'll see methods like Root Locus, Ruth Hurwitz, and the Nyquist stability criteria. These methods allow you to graphically inquire about how your controller that you appended actually altered your fundamental system dynamics and fundamental system stability. I wanted to make this video before diving into all the minutia. I know when I took controls, about 80% of the class was dedicated to determining if a system is stable or not. However, if you want to just control a random system in the wild, it's normally not going to start with a conversation of stability. It's going to start with system identification. You need to find out how your system receives inputs. How does your system respond to inputs? If you have, say, an inverted pendulum, and you wish to balance the inverted pendulum, you need to know if I exert a torque on this joint, how does the system respond to that? And how does it respond to, say, a sinusoidal input, and you vary the frequency, etc.? There's no doubt real-world systems are quite complicated, often nonlinear, and noisy. But if you wish to build complicated autonomous systems, classical control is a crucial foundation to have. Let me know what you guys want to see next, and I hope to build on this video with some more crucial details about control.